see these topics and headings we have seen for uh, last five classes every topic we are going to start based on symptom based approach for a thyroid swelling i am sure sooner or later you will have in the clinics patient coming with a lump in the midline of the neck or a nodule in the thyroid whether it is a toxic non toxic or malignant we need to approach how are we going to do that second if thyroid swelling or a solitary nodule thyroid is asked as an essay or even a short notes on papillary carcinoma thyroid you should be able to answer based on what i call a template based approach by just visualizing as if you are seeing a patient standing or sitting right in front of you that is the second important quality you need to adapt the third important thing is as a surgeon not an endocrinologist or oncologist as a general surgeon what are the things we normally ask as an examiner if you know and what are the key words we like so that will be helpful for you to clear your viva so let's go without much and uh, discussion on thyroid swelling top 20 because from last week as you can see we stopped using this didactic that is lecture module and now going for what i call a question and answer session because it will make you think as we speak and also that will help you to address various issues as you can see in this slide going to here you can see the first at the end of this one one hour or another 30 minutes lecture you will be able to approach a case of thyroglossal cyst long case whatever it is like a multinodular goiter toxic ulterior nodule or a carcinoma thyroid and also you will be ready to write an essay either approach to solitary nodule or even a management of carcinoma thyroid and overview and some short notes is also asked now and then especially retrosternal goiter approach to hypercalcemia things like that so those also you will be able to answer by end of this so it may be looking quite exhaustive then, but i am going to give the essential aspects of this thyroid module okay Rajaram, can you hear and see the slides? Okay, now then I can go non-stop now. Yes, sir, it is okay, sir. Uh, sir, uh, if if possible, you can uh, cut it off your video, sir, because uh, both the thing has to be trans uh, transmitted, no? So some network delay in the yes. data. So you can cut it off your video. Your voice can be easily. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. And when then I'll start with you rather than having it continuously. I think that's what I will do. Okay. Okay. First question, very important thing for any thyroid swelling. Okay, Rajaram, please feel free to interrupt me if you don't have a clear audio signal or yes, any sir. problem with because I have to rely on you now. Yes, sir. Uh, otherwise, we we'll stop sharing from this. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm fine, ready, fine. sir. Fine. Okay. From my side. Okay. Good. the first important thing students is the first important thing as far as you are concerned you should know clearly these four important things as far as the development of thyroid blood supply to thyroid and of course and the importance anatomy and also the clinical importance of the recurrent laryngeal nerve in thyroid surgery and the parathyroid glands few things about these you should understand okay coming to the development if somebody ask you tell me the development of embryology of thyroid gland all you need to say the thyroid gland actually developed from the floor of the mouth that is from the junction of the anterior two third and posterior one third of the tongue from a place called a foramen cecum that's right from foramen cecum there is a caudal migration of the thyroid but which subdivides this thyroglossal duct subdivides as it goes down caudally towards the cricoid cartilage on to the front of the tracheal ring second third and fourth 
it takes a course posterior to the body of the hyoid very very important okay so caudal migration of the thyroglossal duct on its way down it takes the close proximity just behind the body of then further down it goes and along with the thyroid there is a c cells formation and thanks to the neural crust cells so the neural crust cells gives the c cells which are responsible for the production of the you know the what thing calcitonin isn't it so that is the one thing and the other thing is of course t3 t4 from the thyroid itself proper so this is a very important the developmental anatomy i'll tell you the importance shortly the next important thing is the thyroid next to your brain of course your kidney thyroid is a very vascular structure or organ for that matter because it supplies by three vessels the superior thyroid which is the first branch directly from the external carotid artery okay and second is from the subclavian artery you get the inferior thyroid artery if clearly to say subclavian artery the third part gives rise to the thyro cervical trunk from there the inferior thyroid artery but if you say well and good superior and inferior thyroid artery these are the two important things what is the importance of these two vessels they are closely related to two nerves the superior thyroid artery is closely related to external laryngeal nerve whereas inferior thyroid artery is closely related to recurrent laryngeal nerve so when we are trying to control the bleeding by ligating these vessels there is every chance the surgeon could injure either or both these nerves if you injure recurrent laryngeal nerve then you end up having a change in the voice or a hoarseness of the voice that's why we always warn the patient there is usually a temporary disturbances in your voice but it is very very rare to have permanent damage provided we safeguard the nerve during our surgery because the incidence of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury during thyroid surgery is less than 1 to 2% that you should realize it's very rare but patients are worried the next important thing is the superior thyroid artery its association with the external laryngeal nerve which is nothing but it tensor of the cricothyroid muscle so it causes tension of the vocal cords so if you are going to play high pitched voice okay then you are not able to raise your voice very high that's the only difficulty so it will also to some extent affect the voice but not as important as the recurrent laryngeal nerve the third important thing is to realize the recurrent laryngeal nerve if it is injured on both sides there is every chance because the both the vocal cords will come paramedian that is very close to each other patient can develop strider and respiratory distress then patient might require permanent tracheostomy so this is the danger if you injure one now yes only the voice disturbances but if you injure both now there is always a likelihood of permanent damage that's why respiratory distress the third less important artery is a thyroid ema artery which is often from the innominate vessel or sometimes directly from the arch of the aorta as you can see from this picture but this is not important for you so these two vessels are important equally important is the vein as far as the undergraduates are concerned you just to say there are three veins and three arteries three arteries i just mentioned three veins of similar name superior thyroid vein inferior thyroid vein and third important thing is a middle thyroid vein they actually they don't follow most of the places in our body the artery and veins are they are all for like femoral artery and femoral vein they are very close to each other but here actually they go in a different directions they don't approach only the superior thyroid artery and the external laryngeal nerve are friends whereas the vein goes slightly different course what is important out of the all the three veins is the short middle thyroid vein as you can see here 
the middle thyroid vein actually goes and is a very short vein directly drains to the internal jugular vein so when you try to remove the gland if this particular vein is avulsed there is a torrential bleeding directly from the jugular vein so this is a thing for example here you have a long vein you can ligate here also quite a large leash of veins whereas here is a very small stem so the surgeon is worried which vein was only middle thyroid vein trying to mobilize the gland so that is applied anatomy number 2 the third most important for you all is never forget the importance of the recurrent laryngeal nerve okay the recurrent laryngeal nerve is a branch of vagus as the vagus goes around the subclavian artery on the right side or arch of aorta on the left side it gives you a branch which give, takes a ascending or a recurrent course in the tracheoesophageal group that is the term you all should remember this is trachea this is esophagus it goes in between the tracheoesophageal group and if you go next page as it goes in the tracheoesophageal group it goes in between the branches of the inferior thyroid artery so the recurrent laryngeal now can be injured when we are trying to control the inferior thyroid artery doing the ligation so this is the very important thing can you identify the recurrent laryngeal now beforehand yes we need to see how to identify recurrent laryngeal now if they ask you in viva for undergraduates there are only two things you should say one i would look for the recurrent laryngeal nerve in the tracheoesophageal group in midst of the branches of the inferior thyroid artery just behind an important part in the thyroid normally not given importance during our embryology class but it is important for you now as you are slowly coming to a crri and the post graduate that is zugar handle tubercle otherwise called the posterior tubercle of the thyroid see this is actually the posterior process posterior okay of thyroid other is called zugar handle tubercle organ of zugar handle probably you might know that is a para ganglionoma that is it is para aortic uh, parasympathetic system they'll have some tumors there also so similarly zugar handle is a very very important anatomist tubercle is an important anatomical landmark in the thyroid and as you can see the yellow one the recurrent laryngeal now takes usually a course very close and usually this sugar gland tubercle points to it's like tragus your tragus in your external ear actually points to the facial now during the dissection of the parotid gland so parotid gland dissection what is the risk facial now injury how will you avoid facial now injury by trying to identify because the tragus if you dissect it actually gives you that intercartilage as you dissect it gives you indication where the possible site of the nerve similar way this will give an indication zt is zugar gandel tuber okay the next important thing all of you should understand is a thyroid function test the hypothalamus secretes the thyroid releasing hormone t or h which in turn induces the anterior pituitary to produce tsh which again acts on the thyroid to produce the total which becomes free t3 and t4 to have the metabolic action very very because very very important organ for our metabolism it is like something like an engine if you don't have enough t4 that is hypothyroidism you know it is like going in a slow lane whereas if you are hyperthyroidism as if you are driving the fast lane everything is very fast your heart rate is fast your appetite is more and you are sleepless like that it's just opposite so these are the two so if somebody asks you about thyroid function test there are three thyroid function test we do one of course is a hormone level that is total and free t3 and t4 and then tsh level then in some cases we do also isotope scan because that is also functional scan it gives you an idea whether the whole of the thyroid or part of the thyroid is active or not warm nodule cold nodule and a hot nodule that will come to that in a minute okay this is in essence the thyroid the histology you can see 
it is acinic lined usually by the cuboidal epithelium okay and this will become columnar epithelium especially when it becomes a toxic it is hyperactive and this is centrally all this will be filled with the colloid material so this is a very typical picture of thyroid sometimes you will be given a slide to see under microscope in a price exam okay and this is the very important thing i am sure the physiology and also in medicine you will do deal with this but enough as a surgeon to understand this interpretation of thyroid function test in hyperthyroidism if you are given a report they will have a very low tsh and very high t3 or t4 or both hypothyroidism tsh will be high and t3 and t4 will be low so this is a very important thing i am so these are all very basic for all of you now let us go on from the from here some interesting cases okay all of you are sitting and watching this particular lady she is in her 30s presenting with swelling in her neck okay behind her chin for last 3 months painless and you see and what is the diagnosis for undergraduates you can always give a differential diagnosis the differential diagnosis for a swelling in the mid line of the neck are only very few one of course the commonest one is any thyroid nodule or pathology related to thyroid another thing is thyroglossal cyst this patient is actually thyroglossal cyst but even if you say it is a thyroid swelling like a nodule in the isthmus region of the thyroid you won't be penalized the third important thing is lymph node lymph nodes can come anywhere here it could be a submental pleuropharyngeal free tracheal lymph nodes if depending upon where it is if it is there what this lady is having it could be one of those things and the fourth one is subhyoid bursitis and the fifth one if it is further down is like a midline dermoid or even a lipoma so these are the possible differential diagnosis you should entertain but this particular patient you have to do on a very important test that is called a test for thyroglossal cyst i am sure all of you know what is the test first you ask the patient to take a swallow then it moves with the deglutition next ask the patient to open the mouth put the tongue out and in movement of the tongue gives a definite tug if you hold the swelling with your hand if you ask a patient to put out the tongue and put in then they have a definite tug that is a very important thing like just ask a patient like that like that you have just to hold the swelling like this and you see a definite tug in your hand so that's what you should look for okay next important thing of course is the embryology just now i told you the thyroglossal duct what is thyroglossal cyst they'll say it is a embryological remnant of the thyroglossal duct where all it can happen they'll ask you along the path of the thyroglossal duct caudal migration it can be usually just above behind or below the hyoid bone or it may be in front of the thyroid region but what is most important thing is its close association with the body of the hyoid that's why when we do an operation for the thyroglossal cyst we not only remove the cyst we remove the whole thyroglossal duct going right up to the foramen cecum on our way we remove the body of the hyoid so removal of the thyroglossal duct cyst along with the body of the hyoid is called a cyst trans operation if you say that and how will you remove the body of the hyoid they ask that's where we usually take the the bone cutter what the orthopedic surgeon they used to do amputation same small bone cutter is required for cutting the body of the hyoid bone okay next case what is this this person in her in his 40 is having some foreign body sensation as he is trying to swallow food as he puts his tongue out there is a quite a prominent swelling at the junction of the anterior and the posterior thirds of the tongue see you can see a very large swelling here 
this is a very is a pathognomonic finding most important differential diagnosis of course is lingual thyroid but you can make a diagnosis other things like uh, it could be a, a malignant lesion of tongue carcinoma of the tongue also but if you just to feel it will be only soft to form in consistency if it is a lingual thyroid whereas it will be hard and indurated and bleeds certain types if it is a carcinoma and often it will be ulcerated whereas if it is a lingual thyroid usually it will be covered by intact thy i mean mucosa there won't be any ulceration normally what investigation will clinch the diagnosis of course we can do any investigation but the most important investigation they ask you is anybody is radio iodine uptake study because if you do that that not only will confirm because iodine will be taken by the thyroid so it not only confirms your diagnosis that it is a iodine avid lesion so it has to be a lingual thyroid it also will tell whether the patient has an additional thyroid remnant in the normal position if he is having a thyroid remnant here and a small remnant here then you can remove this but if he is having this is the only organ then either you can leave it but if the patient is symptomatic you remove it but replace him with lifelong thyroxine therapy that is what important so iodine uptake study is important both diagnostic and also it will exclude presence of any thyroid tissue in the normal area in the neck also sir say that you have to tell in the exam the next question they'll ask you whenever you have a case of a goiter or a swelling of thyroid what are the different types of goiter you know so for that you have to memorize this particular classification the goiters are classified into three broad categories toxic goiter where they'll have all the toxic symptoms and if you test the blood they'll have increased t3 t4 and a decreased tsh diffuse toxic goiter graves disease toxic multinodular goiter plumbus disease toxic adenoma solitary nodule normally or sometimes after surgery or after incomplete treatment they can have a recurrent toxic goiter that is a rare for you the first three are important and most important is a graves disease is very often a case for you in the exam the second is a non toxic goiter which is much more common because in the exam they usually keep a non toxic very often it can be either diffuse non toxic goiter like a physiological goiter a typical thing is young girl a 15 year old girl or a pregnant lady if they come it is very often it can be like that or endemic if you have somebody coming from uti kodaikanal the area they usually low iodine area that usually endemic goiter is quite common sec next is a multinodular goiter toxic non toxic multinodular goiter is quite quite very common solitary nodule thyroid is also equally common and the special what are the special types can be malignant or autoimmune thyroid malignancy papillary follicular they are both classified as differentiated carcinoma of the thyroid then undifferentiated carcinoma is anaplastic then lymphoma and medullary carcinoma these are the five subtypes what about autoimmune it can be azimatous disease or azimatous thyroiditis de gourvain's or subacute thyroiditis redil's thyroiditis azimatous thyroiditis is very common in our country don't think it is only in the japan it is quite common beware of a middle aged lady presenting with either euthyroid or hypothyroidism with what is the classical finding they'll have a something like a nodular goiter that is both side of the lobules will be en enlarged they'll be very often euthyroid or sometimes hypothyroid and one important blood investigation is thyroglobulin and microsomal antibody so that is what you should say the antibodies will be present that is the most important whereas de gourvain's thyroiditis is a 
painful thyroiditis usually a short history of sore throat they'll present with a painful thyroiditis redil's thyroiditis what is important it is so hard it is otherwise called woody thyroid like a wood that's why it is a differential diagnosis for anaplastic carcinoma of thyroid that's the only reason why this is considered for you otherwise redil's thyroiditis so rare i haven't seen a case myself so don't worry about all this thyroiditis but keep hazimatous thyroiditis in your differential diagnosis okay coming to few points for you for exams especially when you have a short case or a long case of graves disease graves disease patient how they complain i am sure it in medical they visit multiple department they can present with tremor tachycardia these are the two important things okay these are the six t's i want you to remember they'll have a classical thyroid swelling soft diffuse second exophthalmos see staring look that's why i always say just to keep the teeth terrifying eyes with the exophthalmos quite common in a graves disease tremor they have a fine tremor so if you ask a patient i'll show you in a picture you ask a patient to stretch okay the hand okay like this then put a hand then they'll have a fine tremor like that then tachycardia they'll always say sir i have a palpitation i can hear or feel my heart beat then they have a pretibial myxedema and if you do a blood test they'll have a very important thing is that tsh will be low t4 and t3 will be high so this is a classical picture coming to the next slide how will you manage for example you presented a case of long case of thyroid they'll ask you they'll say how what is the treatment for graves disease doctor then you say the treatment it could be either of these three either you can manage them with anti thyroid drugs to decrease the production of the t3 and t4 or you give them a dosage of radioactive iodine third you can submit them for thyroidectomy subtotal thyroidectomy these are the three procedures one or two words about each one if you remember this much it is good anti thyroid drugs what about and what anti thyroid drugs doctor you would like to usually the drugs preferred for graves disease you have to bring the patient to from tachycardia to normal heartbeat for that the best drug is non selective beta blocker usually we give the propranolol you give propranolol the beta blocker then you can also add the patient anti thyroid drugs namely the carbimazole or propyl thiouracil we usually give in our country carbimazole available as neomercosol is available as a 5 or 10 mg tablets you can go depending upon the patient's weight normally an adult patient will require 10 mg three times a day or you can give a bolus like 30 mg daily then after few weeks you can taper it how long the patient usually require this drugs usually up to maximum of 2 years if they don't respond by then you consider other options what is the most important drug reaction of carbimazole anybody can think of if you are thinking it is a granulocytosis you are absolutely right because patient you have to warn the patient you take this drug carbimazole tomorrow if you develop sore throat stop the drug come and meet me because that is the indirect presentation of the a granulocytosis okay sore throat or throat infection next okay because we are actually having a surgical class so we need to discuss about the surgical management so what is the surgical management for toxic goiter for this patient what surgery you will do they'll ask you in the exam and how will you as a resident will prepare this patient for surgery before surgery pre operatively and after surgery if the patient comes to the ward what complications you can anticipate so these are the likely questions first you tell 
I'll preoperatively, I bring, bring the patient to you thyroid state, sir. You don't take the patient as soon as you make a diagnosis. We have to bring the patients T3, T4 level to near normal before take the patient. So for that, what do we give? Beta blocker, neomercosol. Until the time when you do a blood test, the blood say, test shows T3 and T4 are normal. Then in addition, if you are having an examiner like me, who are in the 50s and 60s, they might ask you, what is Leuvol's iodine? The Leuvol's iodine is iodine in potassium iodide. What is it used for? We give this two weeks before thyroid surgery, especially for toxic goiter. Why we give this? Because by giving Leuvol's iodine, we make this thyroid gland less friable, less vascular. It is very vascular, there will be a lot of bleeding and it's very, very difficult to operate on a top. Toxic goiter for a surgeon. Clarity, less friability, 10 drops, three times a day, mixed with milk. So this is a new preparation. Look at the patient's heart rate or a sleeping pulse rate. Normally, when they're sleeping, there is no anxiety. So you can just to see this when the patient at those days, the nurses used to see, admit the patients of thyroid and then they have to have a chart, sleeping pulse rate chart. And it should show the chart, pulse rate should be around 70 to 80. That means it's acceptable. If it is a more than 100, that means patient is still clinically in a toxic state. So you have to continue the drugs until you bring the patient to euthyroid state. Okay, what surgery we do? The name of the surgery is subtotal thyroidectomy. There are various types of thyroidectomy, but here we'll just concentrate for a toxic goiter. There is Graves' disease. The surgery of choice is subtotal thyroidectomy. What do you mean by subtotal thyroidectomy? You remove the whole gland, leaving behind only a small amount of gland that is four grams on each side that is what you should leave okay how to measure four so you say size of my thumb so size of my thumb size gland on either side why we remove that i mean leave that amount of gland because by leaving that amount of gland you avoid hypothyroidism second you also avoid the likely damage to the parathyroid and the recurrent laryngeal nerve so these are the additional advantage okay so that's why you always say you remember two, four, and eight. What is two, four, eight? When you do a thyroidectomy for Graves' disease, you have to preserve both. That is two recurrent laryngeal nerves to be filled. I mean, preserved right and left. Four parathyroid glands to be preserved. Okay, there are totally four parathyroid, and eight grams of thyroid should be preserved. So two, four, eight. That's the way to remember. And what are the complications? There are six complications can happen. Commonest complication of thyroid surgery is, of course, hemorrhage because it's highly vascular, I told you. And if the hemorrhage happens in the neck, patient can have post-operative strider. That is a very important thing. Patients usually sometimes those days used to die because of the strider. Nowadays, we are very, very watchful and we don't have that amount of hemorrhage thanks to the various energy sources to control the bleeding like diathermy machine. Second, if you remove too much of thyroid, if you remove the total thyroid instead of subtotal, patient develop hypothyroidism. If you remove inadequate amount, what will happen? Persistent hyperthyroidism. If you remove parathyroid unknowingly, hypoparathyroidism. How will you know hypoparathyroidism? Patient will develop Tetany, okay. You have to know the all the bedside test for hypoparathyroidism, okay. One of the things is trousseau sign, okay. All these signs you know by taking the blood pressure cuff. If you just put so 
Each one of you just try to recollect what are the signs to test for hypoparathyroidism. I'll come to that in a minute. Next, of course, is postoperatively when I go, go and see a patient next day, patients should have a clear voice. They should not have a hoarseness of voice. If they have hoarseness, that means probably you have injured the recurrent laryngeal now. Okay. Hyperpyroxia is a sign of hyperthyroidism crisis. Okay. When during the thyroid surgery, if you manipulate the thyroid, the T3 and T4 are released into the bloodstream. They cause rapid rise in the T3, T4 level. And then that can cause very high heart rate, sometimes arrhythmias, high temperature, and I mean, sweating, all those things. A patient ended up in the ICU, sometimes they even perish. So this is a very important complication. That's the reason to prevent this hyperthyroid crisis only, we have to bring the patient to thyroid state before we do the operation. But nowadays, thanks to the beta blocker availability, we don't have that problem anymore. And next is, you are making a, a scar in the neck, and if the scar becomes hypertrophic or keloid, patient won't be happy with you, isn't it? So that's about the complication. So this is the thyroid. You remove subtotally, leaving behind four grams one side, four grams, four plus four, eight. Both, all four parathyroid and a recurrent level laryngeal now. So this is what you should leave. Okay. The next question normally, I don't think they'll ask you at undergraduate level. This is a postgraduate level. Sometimes a prize question. Can you differentiate a toxic multinodal goiter and a toxic diffuse goiter. Toxic multinodal goiter is otherwise called a plumber's disease. What is the difference if you ask me this particular tabular column which you are about to see is will help you. A patient with the Graves disease usually they are very young patients, very important. Whereas toxic multinodal goiter usually in their 50s and 60s, elderly people. That's the first important thing. Next, exophthalmus, the terrifying eyes. They are quite common in Graves' disease, very rare. So if you have a patient with exophthalmus, it is actually Graves' disease unless proved otherwise. Okay. So you can be very confident on that. The next important thing is Graves' disease patient, usually they have a diffuse soft gland. And if you put a stethoscope on the thyroid, you can hear bruyi because of the hypervascularity. Whereas it will be nodular gland, firm gland, as far as the toxic multinodal goiter, there is no bruyi in toxic multinodal goiter. But the most important thing in my opinion for all of you to say, the symptoms of Graves' disease are predominantly central nervous system. What do you mean by that? They'll have insomnia, okay, tremor, things like that. Whereas Toxic multinodal goiter predominantly, they'll have CVS. What is CVS mainly? Atrial fibrillation. They'll have arrhythmia. So beware of a lady presenting with atrial fibrillation. There are humpty number of causes for atrial fibrillation. One of the conditions, of course, you know, mitral stenosis with the atrial fibrillation, hypertension with the atrial fibrillation, ischemic heart disease with the atrial fibrillation drug induced atrial fibrillation but the next important thing is thyroid as a cause of atrial fibrillation so five or six differential diagnoses for atrial fibrillation for you okay students i hope you had a good clear understanding of all you need to know about a graves disease let us move on to a very important essay for all of you that is on a solitary nodule thyroid okay i just to stop here Stop sharing also. Rajaram? Yes, sir. Uh, can we, yeah. Can we just give them some time for them to ask questions? You can unmute so that I can give the feedback, get the feedback about whether they are able to follow clearly or I have to go for what My voice, was it continuous without any break? Anybody? Monica? Karshini, you can give a comment on the quality of presentation today so that I can adjust because 
next week onwards we'll be having our own uh, setup so there won't be any problem yeah for ex today you have to excuse me if there is some problem but i'll try to do some justice for your presence here for the next uh, half an hour or so anybody wants to give a comment or questions on so far we have discussed this okay good so i everybody says clear so i just carry on if any clarity so what we have done so far we have seen three cases so far one of course is a thyroglossal cyst cyst trunks operation next of course we have seen a case of lingual thyroid the importance of the iodine scan third important case is a graves disease where you have to do a subtotal thyroidectomy where they may ask you a question how to differentiate a graves disease from toxic multinodular goiter occasionally not often okay if you know that and the rest of the things i am sure once you go through this video this particular next 15 or minutes or so is very very important for you because there we discuss not only a simple solitary nodule and but also the malignancy okay somebody is asking i think navin why thyroglossal cyst appears in a later age group see thyroglossal cyst as you rightly say it is a embryological remnant of the thyroglossal duct ideally it should present in a child the most common age group is actually in the first and second decade usually you have a a boy with 7 year old boy or of 10 year old boy usually come but sometimes they can come bit later why because of the the lip because they get inflamed see the nodule need not be the whole thing cannot need not be a cyst itself the cyst get infected and because of the infection there will be little lymphoid tissue all around that will give rise to a swelling which is palpable for you or visible for you so that's why they present little late so whenever so if there is no infection at all sometimes even at the third or fourth decade there will be a delayed presentation because it is a delayed presentation that doesn't mean it is not an embryological origin for example another classical example is branchial cyst say branchial cyst is a very important cyst on the side of the neck at the junction of the upper one third and lower two third just a tip to the anterior border of the sternomastoid muscle if you are having a cystic swelling on your side of the neck along an imaginary line along the anterior border of the sternomastoid at the junction of the upper one third lower two third that is a branchial cyst the median age group for that is 30 to 40 years see there also similarly this also so for un so that's why i am keep telling some embryological origin maybe etiology but the presentation may be need not be the early age group they can be because of the only if they become infected they are become visible especially because of the infection with the neighboring limb nodal tissue or lymphoid follicular tissue okay let me just start sharing again can you see the slides again rajanam yes sir okay now let's go on to the solitary nodule students when you see a patient of solitary nodule thyroid you have to take a good history examine the patient properly investigate treatment because here i am going to write i mean tell you a template like approach something more sir, like what is it to you sir uh, yes question posted in the chat box yes uh, you can view the question through chat box sir yeah i'll do that at the end or you can read it for me now i can answer now itself okay, okay. and let me just see because uh, let me more chat box seven questions are there yes yeah why i have i have answered yeah discord and nodule yeah we'll come to that next we are going to come there only yeah. eh? all right the nodule we are coming to the nodule now see the most important statement i'm going to make now why people with the swelling in the thyroid come to a surgeon like lump in the breast when the patient comes they always have a fear of malignancy the fear of malignancy only bring the patient to you not because of anything else usually 
they will be cosmetic reasons, pain, they are all rare. So they have a fear. But you need to know as a surgeon or as a doctor, the chance of malignancy in thyroid is only about 5 to 10 percent at the maximum. So it is very rare. Okay. But the, the fear is there that brings the patient to you. But you need to allay the fear from the patient by doing a proper investigation. For that, as an undergraduate, you have to take a good history of thyroid. Doesn't matter whether it's a nodule, Graves disease. This is a very important thing. If you have a pen and pad, you take down the headings. You ask three important questions as far as the thyroid is concerned. One, regarding the swelling. Okay, you say there is a swelling in your neck. When did it start? Three months ago, doctor, it gradually increased in size. And the last two weeks, I am having a pain. And that's why I came one patient might say. Other patient says, sir, I didn't notice anything. My neighbor, after three, four months, she came to see me yesterday, suddenly said, there's something in your neck. Then I went and saw in front of the mirror, then only noticed. See, it's sometimes you, because it is a gradual change in your body, sometimes you don't notice, especially when you start talking or swallowing, the patient or the person in front of you sometimes notices. So these are the two classical presentations. Sudden change can happen in a nodule, which is small, two centimeter the day before. Suddenly, it will become four centimeter today. How can it happen? Because of hemorrhage. That's right. If there is a multinodular goiter with the degenerative changes with the hemorrhage, suddenly it will come as a presentation. So sudden change in the size, if they say, you can always say a sudden change, gradual increase in size, it could be malignancy, but a sudden change invariably it is because of the hemorrhage, because of degenerative changes in a multinodular goiter. Next important thing is thyroid can give rise to pressure to your trachea, esophagus, recurrent laryngeal nerve, carotid vessels or anything in your neck can be pressurized depending upon the size. So it can give rise to accordingly difficulty in breathing, difficulty in swallowing, change of voice or even giddiness if it presses too hard on the carotid. So these are the four pressure symptoms. You have to tell in exam one word, no pressure symptom. That is enough. But if you want to impress the examiner, you can tell there is no history suggestive of dyspnea, dysphagia, dysphonia, or dizziness. Four Ds. Okay. Next, you have to tell whether patient has a toxic symptoms or not. Very, very important. Then if you say in the history itself, some toxic symptom, then your diagnosis at the end is going to be some sort of toxic goiter because clinically patient has symptoms. So these are the symptoms. Common thing is the warmth, excess sweating and the GIT, you know, raise his appetite and also losing weight. I told you last class itself. Imagine four subset of patients I am telling you. Classical thyroid patient, that will be, they'll be eating well. They'll even if 10 at least they can eat but they'll be fading away right in front of you. They are losing weight like anything. Only two conditions, classical conditions. One is a thyrotoxicosis. Next, of course, is insulin-dependent diabetes or uncontrolled diabetes. Both will be eating ni nicely, but they'll be wasting. Whereas one third condition where they will not have, an, I mean, appetite, anorexia, okay? And they'll be losing weight. That is, of course, is a tuberculosis. And the fourth is no change in the appetite, but they'll be losing weight. That, of course, is a HIV. So, they will be just fading away. So, these are the four classical things. Neoplasm, malignancy, you can fit in anywhere. But neoplasm, usually, again, they will have anorexia and weight loss. So, these are all some clue to give you. But this is the best combination. A patient with a good appetite, still significant loss of weight, more than 5 kilos in the last 3 months. Very, very important. Diarrhea, toxic symptom. Tremor, insomnia, agitation, okay, angry, getting angry or nervousness, all those things or palpitation. These are all signs of toxicity. Just the opposite to that will be hypothyroidism. So we can ask also. So the patient has no toxic symptoms or no myxedema symptoms either way. Of course, past history, personal and menstrual history because menstrual history is very, very important because thyroid nodule, one in three patients are women and especially there is hyperthyroidism causes 
amenorrhea, hypothyroidism causes menorrhagia. That is a paradox. That's only opposite. And also in a uh, familial history, any family members having any thyroid, okay, it's important, especially a familial disease like medullary carcinoma in MEN syndrome, okay. Coming to the next important thing is, now you imagine, visualize as if you have a, a patient with a toxic goiter, a patient with a multinodular goiter, a patient with a solitary nodule, three different patients sitting right in front of us, okay. We will see one by one. How will you examine? You first examine general examination. Then examination of the thyroid. Okay. So these are the two important things you have to see. So first you examine the patient as a whole. And as soon as you go near, you can see the terrifying eyes. Then ask the patient, summer. Then look at the legs, edema, edema non-pitting edema. That is peritibial mixed edema. Okay, three is three, relevant to. Of course, you have to tell patient is not anemic, not sinus, not dyspnea, clubbing, all those things you say. But these are three specific things you always say present or absent. Next, of course, is examination, inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate. So, what do you inspect? Very, very important thing. Okay, we'll come and we'll go for the pictures now. Okay, this is a very important. You just see a staring, terrifying eyes of exophthalmus. You are able to see the upper limbus of the cornea. This is because of the lid retraction. You are able to see this bit. Normally, this is covered by the upper eyelid for most of us. So if that is seen, that is exophthalmus. In proptosis, actually the term proptosis and exophthalmus, they use interchangeably. But for you, proptosis, you see both the limbus both upper and lower limbus seen. And usually it is because of the retroorbital lesion, like a tumor, orbital tumor, okay? And a cavernous sinus thrombosis or carotid cavernous fistula. All those rare conditions can give rise to this problem, okay? Next important thing is The tremor, this is the way, always you have a piece of paper, put it on the patient in a hand, which is just looking downwards, okay? So this is actually pronated hand, you just put it on the dorsum of the hand like this, then you can see the fine tremor. The fine tremors are present in alcoholic also, any peripheral neuropathy also they can have. Alcoholic patients, typically they have a fine tremor. Same thing also with this patient. Peritibial myxedema. They'll have something like a pudy orange appearance skin. They'll have a edematous appearance, okay, like a lymphedema. This is the most important thing for you is test of thyroid, they'll ask you. This is very, very important. Very, It may look very simple for you. You have to give a patient a glass of water to test. Very often we do that in our country is just ask the patient to swallow their own saliva. You can imagine you may not be the first candidate to examine the patient. The same patient is given for 10 different students. So if you are the 10th student, you ask the patient to swallow again. He'll be, sir, how many times I can do this test? Okay, they'll be fed up. So it's a courtesy, always like a, our hospitality in our country, give a glass of water. So definitely you will impress the examiner. I'm sure in a Western country, the most important courtesy. Here we, they don't stress, but I, it is a good habit always give a disposable glass of water, ask them to keep it in the mouth, and then just go behind the patient. So inspect from front, palpate from behind. These are the two dictums for thyroid. So look from the front, whether there is a swelling in the region of thyroid and inspect the size, sight moves with the declination. Then go behind and palpate. Okay, that's another important thing I want to tell you here itself. Okay. The next important thing is what? This is palpation. So inspect from front, palpate from behind. You feel with the both hand, warm hand, and the size of the nodule, if they are single nodule or multiple nodule, whether if there is a one nodule, we can always say, well, we are going to show some cases, I'll tell you. Then describe everything, size, firmness, whether it's tender or not, everything. The next important thing is with your right index finger, you feel your finger from the 
thyroid cartilage run your finger like that and look for the tracheal position whether it is deviated if so which side it deviated if there is a nodule on the right side if at all it is deviated it tend to deviate to the opposite side the common sense so is there, most of them there won't be any deviation but if at all it should be on the opposite side okay right unless they have an associated fibrosis of the lung because of tuberculosis is pushed to the pull to the same side so that is a common sense you have to see okay in other words your clinical finding should correlate each other if there is a large thyroid swelling in the right lobe of thyroid i expect the trachea to move to the opposite side towards the left side isn't it next is with the stethoscope you look for the bruy it is usually very very important in a case of toxic goiter and also you percuss over the manubrium sternae either with your hand or directly you can percuss okay you need not put your this hand you can directly percuss with your finger middle finger over that dullness in the over the manubrium sternum is a indirect i mean evidence of normally it will be resonant for all of us it is indirect evidence of retrosternal extension okay like here for example a patient is having a large nodule in the left lobe of the thyroid about 8 cm into 6 cm lobulated swelling skin over the swelling is normal there is no redness there is no dilated veins there is no previous scar okay this is what inspection finding you can say there are some fine telangiectatic veins are seen in the upper neck if you really want to be uh, if you are seeing the laptop you will see and on inspection sometimes you can say in the thigh i mean trachea appears to be deviated to the right side but in palpation definitely if you run your finger clinically and also radiologically you can see there is a shift of the trachea the tracheal air shadow will be shifted because of the retrosternal extension of the thyroid like this okay so here for example another lady as you can see this particular patient is having a large enlarged thyroid occupying both the right lobe and isthmus and other side it is about 10 cm into 8 cm skin over the swelling is normal there is no dilated veins no scar okay and the lower border of the thyroid is visible you have to tell okay if the lower border of the gland if you say not visible you are indirectly telling the examiner that there is a likelihood of extension retrosternally but you can always tell in the palpation again in on palpation from behind the patient when i felt i can feel the lower border of the thyroid so if you say that i can feel the lower border of thyroid that means what you are excluding the possibility of retrosternal goiter okay if it is a retrosternal goiter how you have to express it looks i and the thyroid the lower border of the thyroid is not easily palpable sir i will do an x ray of the chest and the thoracic inlet to see any retrosternal extension the next examiner will ask you okay don't wait for the x ray can you do any other test to see whether the patient has a retrosternal extension now itself yes sir i'll percuss over the manubrium sternum then he'll ask you okay anything else you can do to see whether the patient has any indirect evidence of retrosternal extension there you can do one more test that is if there is a, some swelling extending onto the retrosternum it will cause superior mediastinal compression so there will be engorged veins in the neck especially if you do hyper abduction that is what you should do so i'll say i'll ask a patient to raise both hands like that sir then that time patient will have some puffiness and also dilated veins over the neck if it is then that is a pemberton sign you all know already so that is where so you, if the examiner might slowly take you to more and more difficult questions that's the way you have to so you have to follow the examiner's question and answer appropriately that is what important for you okay here for example again there is a, a nodular goiter occupying both the lobes of thyroid you can see there is one dilated vein over the left lobe there is no scar okay and here for example there is a large thyroid you can say there is a thyroid is very much enlarged more on the left side than the right side so right side isthmus and left side all extending 
and if you are very good in your analysis you can always say it extends from the posterior border of the sternomastoid on the one side to the posterior border of the other side like that you can go and you tell the extension i can see the lower border of the thyroid is easily visible okay so like that you can carry on describing as descriptive as possible okay and here what is the swelling here if you see here the what is arrow mark here this patient if, if you inspect from friend there is a small 3 cm swelling in the region of the right lobe of thyroid in the isthmus it moves easily with the deglutition okay and i felt uh, from standing behind the patient and uh, it feels very firm in consistency moves with the deglutition and uh, it is painless and moves freely lower border felt then i came again into the front to feel for the trachea trachea is in the midline so this is a very classical case of solitary nodule of thyroid right lobe okay so like that you can keep on examining this is pemberton sign the way to examine and this is the reason is retrosternal extension large thyroid gland okay next what is berry sign they will ask you berry is a very very important terminology as far as the thyroid is concerned why because i didn't uh, tell in the beginning itself they will ask you why thyroid moves with the swallowing because the thyroid is attached to the trachea because of the berry ligament the berry ligament is a thyro and also tracheo thyroid ligament so the thyroid gland is attached to the trachea by this berry's ligament and the recurrent laryngeal nerve is actually closely related to the berry's ligament the recurrent laryngeal nerve it enters just behind the craco thyroid joint and it enters the larynx that's the place the berry so because of the berry ligament we are able to demonstrate the movement with the swallowing that is the thing what is berry sign in case of malignancy thyroid cancer sometime not always sometimes the carotis gland is not pushed but it is engaged encased that means the growth goes all around the thyroid so you are not able to feel the pulsation of the carotid on the side of the thyroid cancer so i am able to feel the right side carotid artery pulsation left side is not felt that means patient's nodule on the left side is possibly it could be a cancer of thyroid with the encasement or encroachment of the carotid vessel sign of infiltration okay see for example if this particular thyroid gland if it is malignancy it will go around this and it will cause you not able to feel normally the carotid should be palpable behind the thyroid nodule even in a multinodal goiter only in a malignant goiter you will not be able to feel the pulsation of the carotid on the side of the nodule that is called berry sign and this is the berry's ligament between the thyroid and the trachea here and the, the see the yellow that is a recurrent laryngeal nerve how closely it is related to the berry's ligament okay this is little applied anatomy okay so far i'll tell you now it's all if you have a case in examination as an undergraduate the commonest case given to an undergraduate is non toxic non malignant multinodular goiter okay that is the commonest swelling the second is non toxic solitary nodule thyroid third condition is a partly treated graves disease because sometimes graves disease they come they get admitted for a few days they by the time you see the patient in the exam usually they have partially treated so you have to keep that and the fourth very rare only you will have a malignancy fifth one is a hashimoto's thyroiditis so you keep these five conditions in your mind and in exam invariably it is one of these four four or five cases only don't make a rare diagnosis of radial thyroiditis or anaplastic carcinoma of the rare diagnosis okay because they are so rare and they won't usually keep it in the examination for you especially for undergraduate but when you have a case and if they have any of this in the history or in the examination you can always tell the examiner this patient's thyroid can be a case of malignant thyroid why because of the age the age is very very important 
this is a very peculiar condition in thyroid extremes of age group is i mean they are prone for cancer see normally we say a elderly people like 50s and 60s only they are more prone for cancer but some especially here in thyroid less than 20 or more than 60 both are equally important if you have a 15 year old boy take it from me 15 year old boy with a solitary nodule it is 100% it is a papillary carcinoma of thyroid thyroid papillary carcinoma is so common in children because solitary nodule in a male child is rare expressed so you have to have that as a differential diagnosis so age is very important both age extreme 20 or 60 and also female thyroid normally it is benign if it is a male patient coming you suspect malignancy okay can it be and also if they have a short rapid growth only 3 months the swelling is of this size if they have pressure symptoms like hoarseness suspect malignancy family history of medullary carcinoma one of the family a patient you have also may be medullary carcinoma like a familial etiology suspect or history of radiotherapy in a child for a like a um, thyroid like hodgkins lymphoma things like that suspect malignancy what about the clinical signs when you examine any gland whether it is a breast thyroid whenever a nodule or a swelling is hard in consistency or fixity either to the skin or deeper structures or regional lymph node because lymph node metastasis or vocal cord palsy if the patient has obviously voice disturbances or if you do a indirect laryngoscope the movement of the vocal cord is affected it is invariably malignancy because benign lesions usually they don't cause vocal cord palsy themselves isn't it unless there is post operative case so these are all the clinical symptoms and signs of malignancy you have to really memorize this and if you have a nodule i told you already you do all case of thyroid biochemical test first thing is total free t4 t3 tsh that is the first thing you go hashimatos also you have to exclude for that auto antibodies medullary carcinoma only way you can exclude by doing a plasma calcitonin study that's why all the biochemistry x ray done to see for retrosternal extension ultrasound isotope fnac now we go to see okay now coming to the ultrasound all of you or most of you might have attended the class last week the breast isn't it why we do ultrasound in the breast ultrasound is useful for any lesion in our body whether the lesion contains fluid or solid that is cystic or solid it will tell you that is a one advantage second single or multiple nodule because clinically only if it is 1 cm or large you can feel otherwise small nodules will not feel your hand so the ultrasound is a sensitive hand so it will be able to tell you multiple nodules third of course is ultrasound you put it on the neck and do a guided fnac or guided through cut biopsy so same three answers we used in the breast also fourth one i said in there it's a elastography same elastography here also can be used in thyroid also to some extent so ultrasound same see for example here we are doing an ultrasound if a good sonologist there he is able to show it is only high frequency probe you will be able to see the trachea in front of the trachea you see the isthmus the thyroid in front of the thyroid the pre thyroid muscles the thyroid don't worry about the names because it is all for post graduates and here it is the carotid vessels you will be able to see if there is any nodule you will be able to appreciate okay carotid artery and vein you will be able to see with the doppler you will be able to see the flow pattern in the vessels okay if it is a tumor it will be encasing it with tumor will be infiltrating all around the carotid clinically you will not be able to feel the pulsation of the carotid okay that's about it but for you now to go for this very important understanding that is isotope scan what is hot nodule warm nodule and cold nodule okay somebody was asking discordant and thing like that so instead of that this terminology is more often used and understand it understandable for all of you and also for general surgeon okay that is you give the patient your radioisotope what is the radioisotope normally we give 
the commonest isotope for diagnostic purpose is technetium 99 m per technetate that is what we give for a therapeutic that is if you want to give a patient a treatment for a radioactive iodine therapy like toxic goiter or malignant goiter you give radioactive iodine so iodine technetium both are isotopes and technetium is commonly used for a diagnostic scan that is the first thing you should know and you give the patient and put the gamma camera like this and read if imagine the patient is having a nodule on the right side of the neck nodule on the right lobe okay if that particular nodule is non functioning if it is not working like a cyst if it is a cyst what it has only fluid no functioning cells so it, there won't be any uptake of isotope so it will be cold so there won't be any spot here it will be there won't be any uptake whereas if it is in the only portion which is active like a toxic adenoma in other words this is the only it says the only one student out of the 100 students very active is listening so he takes up all the technetium and he suppresses the rest of the school class or rest of the thyroid so the all of the thyroid will be suppressed all whatever iodine whatever technetium we give only go to that area which is palpable clinically that is called a toxic adenoma that is a hot nodule what is in between hot warm for example for you and me what will happen it will be uniformly uptake it will be warm thyroid here and there if there are small nodule there are functioning nodule so this is functioning nodule this is hyper functioning nodule this is non functioning nodule hyper functioning taking all the food you are giving one person eating everything there is hot nodule that is that is toxic adenoma benign lesion a cold nodule non functioning fellow this is what you need to be interested in see for example here here there is cold nodule no uptake here there is some uptake of iodine or a i mean technetium whatever you give this is a typical cold nodule in the left lower pole okay and what is the cause there are five different causes for cold nodule if you remember that that is well and good commonest cause of course is a multi nodular goiter with a degenerating colloid nodule that area is not functioning okay defunctioning or degeneration like hemorrhage or degenerating colloid nodule or if it is a thyroid cyst or it is a focal lymphocytic thyroiditis there is a small entity you have to remember that okay but more, what is important is the last two it could be also follicular adenoma or a carcinoma in other words i told you also in the first slide itself only 5% of the solitary nodule okay is malignant but if you ask me if you say your patient is coming with a cold nodule as a diagnosis what is the chance what is the commonest i can tell you degenerating colloid nodule will be about 50 to 60% of them cold nodule i see every day cyst about 10 to 15% lymphocytic thyroid is about 5% follicular adenoma about 10% or 10 to 15% carcinoma 10% okay 10% of the cold nodule or 5% of all nodule is malignant if you remember that statement it is well and good see i repeat again 10% of cold nodule is cancer nodule or 5% of all nodule is solitary nodule okay or uh, cancer coming to the fnac this is a very important test we do a patient comes after the clinical examination what important test bedside test we can do they will ask you fnac sir what is fnac fine needle aspiration cytology and tell me about how will you do and when will you do they'll ask you these are the simple questions you have to prepare because breast and thyroid used to be every answer in your fingertip take a 10 ml syringe with a blue needle that is 23 gauge needle no need for local anesthesia because you go in and just several times you go in and take an aspirate and you air dry it or put a isopropyl alcohol and fix it and see under microscope ideally by an experienced cytologist okay then he will be able to tell you exactly what he is dealing with and you will be able to plan for treatment but is it good 
investigation they ask you the limitation is one follicular neoplasm it is of no use that you have to tell fnac will diagnose degenerating nodule cyst in focal thyroiditis thyroid cancer but only one problem or the disadvantage if they ask you is it will not differentiate a follicular carcinoma and a follicular adenoma because a follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma the differentiation is based on only histology not cytology what histological feature if they ask you there are two classical features i am sure most of you might know i repeat it is a capsular and a vascular invasion so you have to demonstrate the thyroid capsule is invaded and also vessels are invaded by the malignant cells only sign of invasion is proved by histology you can tell it is a follicular carcinoma if there is no capsular no vascular invasion it is a follicular adenoma so this differentiation i can't do with just by cells because i am not seeing any capsule not seeing any vessels here only cells see so you have to be very very good in that one like breast here also there is a bethesda score 1 to 6 higher the score risk of malignancy 5 or 6 score means it is a malignant cells okay so what are the malignant see i told you already the five different types the differentiated mean follicular and papillary undifferentiated lymphoma medullary out of them 60% of the cancer or i would say simply for you most of the cancer we see every day is papillary carcinoma thyroid or follicular carcinoma the rest are only for post graduate not for you undergraduates like anaplastic lymphoma even medullary carcinoma can be asked in viva not kept in the examination so don't make this diagnosis and go into trouble okay here is a classical case i am showing you a papillary carcinoma thyroid with a lymph nodal metastasis an elderly man a 60 year old man presenting with the two months history of swelling in the left lobe of thyroid and isthmus and the last one month he also observed an additional swelling developing on the left lateral aspect of the neck on clinical examination i could feel there is a on inspection there is a large swelling occupying the left lobe of thyroid and isthmus with a few dilated veins and telangiectatic area on the extreme and it is extending from the anterior border of the right sternomastoid to the posterior border of the left sternomastoid the lower border of the thyroid is visible there is no obvious scar in addition i can feel another well circumscribed swelling in the just above the left lobe of the thyroid region and about 2 to 3 cm below the angle of the mandible anterior border is about 3 cm from the midline posteriorly it extends up to the posterior border of the sternomastoid okay and the skin over the swelling is stretched there is no scar ulceration or sinus formation it is not pulsatile it's a very important thing because it is in the carotid triangle region you have to add an additional term so it is not pulsatile okay and on palpation it is not warm it is not tender it is hard in consistency like that you can go on and i can feel the lower border of the thyroid and the trachea feels and felt in the midline there is no deviation of the trachea there is no bruising then i could not feel the left carotid pulse separately very sign positive okay all those things we can tell so that gives indirectly that you are very very comprehensive in your clinical presentation you are able to elicit most if not all the findings the examiner will really appreciate you your presentation then they may ask you a relevant question what age group is common papillary carcinoma i told you already extremes of age less than 20 and more than i mean 40 50 also so both age groups are common next is histologically it can be sometimes you can have multifocal lesion one tumor maybe you may be seeing but there may be for example the last case if you see here he is having predominantly here 
but there may be some microscopic element on the right side also. So any patient with a papillary carcinoma nowadays, the dictum is they have to undergo total thyroidectomy, ideally near total thyroidectomy. And the next important thing is the spread is almost always lymph nodal spread, very, very important. That's why usually they present with the only sometimes you will not feel this swelling will be very small one. Okay, they'll only present with this one. That's why those days we used to make a diagnosis of lateral aberrant thyroid. Or if you do an FNAC of this, they'll see a papillary cells. Then they'll say, okay, this is a secondary from a impalpable or microscopic deposit in the thyroid. So that is also possible. So it can be occult also. Occult tumors are known to occur in various parts of our body. The two important things you should understand is occult tumor in thyroid, there is papillary carcinoma. Another thing is occult tumor in prostate gland. That is also important. So prostate also can be occult small tumor. How do we know? If you do a PSA, tumor marker, there will be raised PSA. Or if you do an ultrasound of the bladder and a prostate region, that will show a small nodule. If you feel, it may not be palpable with your rectal examination. So these are the two classical occult carcinoma you can recollect until the examiner. Lymphatic spread is the common spread. The treatment of choice normally nowadays, you stick to one diagnosis um, treatment that is total thyroidectomy. You'll be wondering what this particular things, I'm coming to this classical thing is the histology is a clear nuclei. See all the nuclei are very, very clear. Okay, so this is a very, very classical appearance and also they have something like a sonoma body also. Okay, so what are the things about the follicular carcinoma? I told you follicular carcinoma means vascular capsular invasion. Okay, they are like this capsular and vascular invasion as you can see from this slide and they usually blood spread very, very important because of vascularity they go through the blood. And bony spread, B and B, you remember, blood spread and also expansile or pulsatile secondaries. This is a very, very classical presentation. Only two conditions, malignant conditions that can give rise to this classical present. Like this, for example, you have a large expansile secondary in the upper end of the humerus of this patient. Another expansile secondary the same patient had was in the skull also. So these patients are having a classical presentation, they can present with a, a pulsatile skull also, scalp also, pulsatile skull, all bone ends also pulsatile swelling. Only two things, renal cell carcinoma and a follicular carcinoma thyroid. These are a highly vascular tumor, blood spread, they give rise to pulsatile second, bony secondaries, total thyroidectomy. And because they are all radio, I, I mean functioning tumor, differentiated tumors, they will be sometimes even need not be cold nodule, they can be warm nodule. Radio iodine treatment is a treatment of choice for both papillary and follicular. Okay. And the prognosis papillary is best, follicular is the next best. Both are good. Okay. Actually, if you see, I'll come to that in a minute. And this is for price exam going out of you, whoever wanted to. And can you say which patient is going to do well? are not prognostic criteria. I told you already in the breast, whenever you don't know anything about this thing, always you tell, it all depends upon the stage of the disease and also the grade of the tumor. You will turn. So these two, you feel stage of the disease is TNM, isn't it? Tumor size. So here also, for example, tumor size more than five centimeter. Nodal state, extra, extent of the spread. If there are some extends outside the gland, extra thyroidal papillary carcinoma onto the node. So TN, M, distal metastasis. So if you don't know all this, ages is a very important criteria. Ages criteria means age, grade, extent of the spread, size of the tumor. So on base of that, they actually have a classification, but these are all not important for you from Mayo School of Thought. This is for postgraduate, for you if you tell the prognosis depends upon three things. One, the patient's stage of the disease, that is TNM. Second, grade of the tumor, whether it is a differentiator or undifferentiated. Third important thing is age of the patient. Elderly patient, poor prognosis. Younger patient is a good prognosis. Okay. 
So these are the two things you should know. The next important thing you should realize is a treatment post surgically. What treatment we give? Because all the functioning tumors, we give radio iodine therapy because it is like chemotherapy you give for all the cancers. Similarly, here whatever you are you able to see, you are removing by surgery. But whatever are like the roots of the tree, small microscopic elements left over in the thyroid bed can be tackled by giving a radioactive iodine therapy. So post-operative radio iodine therapy prevents the chance of local recurrence. And keep the patient on thyroid hormone. Why we give thyroid hormone? Two reasons. One reason, because you have done a total thyroidectomy, patient is becoming hypothyroidism. So you need to replace, you have to treat the hypothyroidism. Is there any other reason? Yes. Why this thyroid tumor, especially papillary and follicular, they are all hormone responsive tumor. Okay, so you give the patient a high dose T4, that is L toxin. That is, you give thyroxin for them, so high dose, so you suppress the patient TSH level. So by suppressing the TSH, you suppress the growth of the thyroid carcinoma. So that is the treatment modality. Why we give thyroid hormone for this patient for life? If they ask you, you just tell. Okay. Then what about the follow-up? All these patients, is there any tumor markers for thyroid? If ask you for differentiated cancer, that is for papillary and follicular, you have serum thyroglobulin because see, thyroglobulin is synthesized by thyroid. For medullary carcinoma, serum calcitonin. So these are all the tumor markers you have to remember. Okay, I told you also for breast, even though we don't have a, a well-identified tumor markers, you can say sometimes CA15-3 can be used as a tumor marker. But the tumor markers are very important in some tumors like ovarian cancer, CA125. And also prostate cancer, that is PSA for colonic cancer, that is carcinoembryonic antigen for pancreatic cancer, that is CA19-9. Like that you should come, if you keep on repeating, it should come automatically. The common tumor markers, you have to be ready. As soon as the exam asks you, tell me some tumor markers, you just name some tumor markers. Then you, they'll ask you, what is the importance of tumor markers? You can always say tumor markers are of diagnostic and prognostic importance. Diagnostic, if there is raised, that means there is a tumor. Prognostic, if they keep raising in spite of your treatment, that means bad prognosis, sir. So it is a diagnostic and prognostic indication. Okay. Now coming to the last few slides in another 10 minutes, we'll be finishing. Medullary carcinoma thyroid. This is a rare diagnosis for undergraduates, but beware. This is interesting mainly because of M stands for MEN syndrome. It is part of the MEM2. MEN1 and 2, it is MEN2. And it is by red oncogene. Okay, the red oncogene is very important for your MCQ also. And it can be a, like a small nodule or it can be multiple nodule can be present. But the classical histology is presence of amyloid material. Very, very important. If you see a eosinophilic material in the thyroid, that is invariably a spotter for you. It is a medullary carcinoma. And this is MEN1, I mean, sorry, 2A and 2B. And medullary carcinoma is present in both. But that only difference is in both, there will be medullary carcinoma, pheochromocytoma, and in A, you have a parathyroid, in B, you have only ganglioneuromatosis. Now, what is its importance? If you suspect MEN2, you have to look for pheochromocytoma, and you have to operate the pheochromocytoma before you touch the patient's neck for medullary carcinoma. Because pheochromocytoma can give rise to what? Malignant hypertension. So that is what very, very important. So for that only you have to do the MIBG scan. See, here is a MIBG scan or MRI of the abdomen to look for the pheochromocytoma either in the adrenal or in the para, I mean, sympathetic chains. What is SESTA-MB scan? The SESTA-MB scan is for the 
parathyroid tumors okay this is a very busy slide for you but i don't think it is important for you this is prepared by me for post graduates but people some of you may be really keen to have an essay written nicely so this is gives you all the things you need to know especially if an essay is asked on carcinoma thyroid like for example i'll give an example papillary carcinoma you can write an essay with these headings it is the commonest there is 60% age group i told you both 20 to 40 it can be multifocal lymphatic spread fnac diagnostic you do a near total thyroidectomy and you remove the tumors also by berry picking okay and very good prognosis follicular carcinoma blood spread okay and radio iodine is useful if it is especially when they have a bony metastasis anaplastic forget it, it is so rare but only thing is it is very poor prognosis six months patient will die because of strider anaplastic is you can always tell rapidly growing tumor patient goes for strider and they die quickly so it's a very deadly cancer in anaplastic cancer medullary carcinoma it is a peculiar cancer because of the familial history in some patients 20% of the people will have and they have amyloid stroma that is the only thing i want you to remember okay now what are the types of thyroidectomy you know because now you know already two one is a subtotal for graves disease total or near total for cancer here are all the different types of thyroidectomy for you removing the only one lobe no longer done hemi thyroidectomy removing the involved lobe along with the isthmus they'll ask you why isthmus is removed because if you only remove only lobe if the isthmus is enlarged in okay if the lobe is enlarged it may not be that easily visible but isthmus being right in front of the tracheal rings it will be easily visible so always nowadays a dictum the minimum operation we do in thyroid nowadays from today onward is hemi thyroidectomy so hemi thyroidectomy is lobe the involved lobe along with isthmus subtotal thyroidectomy is for toxic goiter near total or a total thyroidectomy safeguarding the parathyroids under recurrent laryngeal nerve is for the malignancy and other things you don't i mean worry about it okay isthmectomy is only if they have a strider and anaplastic cancer sometimes we do partial is we do rarely for a multinodular goiter non toxic because of cosmetic region whichever is the larger nodule we remove it but the, those things are not necessary for you just remember this four and whenever you are asked tell me how will you do thyroidectomy i bet they will not ask an undergraduate about the steps of procedure but still it is better you know something as a resident or a crri you should know subtotal thyroidectomy tell me if they ask you you always say subtotal thyroidectomy is indicated for a graves disease i'll admit the patient i'll get a concern and i always want the patient for a temporary hoarseness of voice before surgery itself get that in writing because recurrent laryngeal nerve can be damaged in some people always better to inform the patient they, so in other words they'll ask you what are the things for example parotid operation they always say i'll get a concern for possible temporary palsy of facial nerve here it is a recurrent laryngeal nerve for example if they say cancer colon what concern you have i do a concern for a colectomy also possibility rare possibility of colostomy like that you have to tell them the informed concern next is a pre operative preparation here i have to bring the patient to u thyroid state okay physician this patient is lying supine head end of the patient has to be raised in all head and neck surgery to reduce the venous pressure so venous congestion will be less so there will be less bleeding so head end is raised and incision is low skin collar incision you have to write all this low skin collar incision from the posterior border of the sternomastoid one side to the other side skin flaps raised both superior and inferior thyroid arteries are ligated safeguarding the nerves then thyroid depending upon the operation subtotal or total removed hemostasis is achieved one drain is placed 
and closure is done in layers. Post operatively, I watch for this complication. Hemorrhage. If it happens here where the thyroid was originally, it can cause laryngeal edema and strider. So I have to be very careful. That's why we keep a small tube that is called a drain to take any collected fluid. And I'll also watch the patient for any hoarseness of the voice because of the damage to these two nerves. Hypothyroidism. How will you tell? You can just tap in front of the tragus to look for any facial tics. Okay, patient, facial nerve stimulation. Or you put a cuff, BP cuff and raise the systolic BP and patient goes for what? The typical carpopedal spasm, isn't it? So when you put a cuff on this patient, so patient goes, hand will go like this. A coach's hand. So the flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint and extension of the interphalangeal like this. Okay, like that they'll go slowly. Both hands will go like this. Okay, as soon as you give IV, calcium gluconate, then they'll get better. So hypoparathyroid. Because why it happens in the same night it will happen is parathyroid hormone, unlike the thyroid hormone, is having half-life of only few minutes. So the only hormone in our body which is having a very short half-life, you should remember that, the importance of half-life. But a thyroid, T3 has a half-life of two to three days. Okay, so even if you have the whole gland removed, they will not show the evidence of hypothyroidism immediately. Okay, whereas hypoparathyroidism can happen in the same day and night of operation because of the short half-life of parathormone. If you remember that, that is well and good. Rarely in a patient with a tracheomalacia, that is a big tracheal wall, because of the chronic swelling of thyroid, they can go for a tracheomalacia and strider. Okay, these are all the complications. And the last thing for hypercalcemia, let me see, it's actually we crossed the time. Let me quickly go one or two things. This is just for completion sake, I'm asking you. Sometimes they may ask you about parathyroid. Parathyroid is not for undergraduates. It is for postgraduates. First, I'll tell you. But it is important for you. One important thing they'll ask you, what are the few causes for hypercalcemia? If you do a blood test, patient's calcium is more than 11, 12 like that. Normally, it's less than 10 grams, isn't it? So hypercalcemia, there are humpty number of causes, but you remember these four causes, at least three causes. Metastasis, like a breast cancer with a bony metastasis. Multiple myeloma. Third is MEN syndrome. One of the common causes for MEN syndrome is hyperparathyroidism because of adenoma or tumor of the parathyroid. That's why I'm bringing this particular topic to you. But there are other reasons for hypercalcemia. In medicine, you will be reading all these things. But as a surgeon, if you remember, these three is well and good. The fourth cause is very rare, milk alkali syndrome. What if at all you want to remember is sarcoidosis is the other cause for hypercalcemia. Okay. And hyperparathyroidism is one condition where the, you always probably you might have read this. Patient will have bony pain. They'll come with the recurrent renal stones. So bone, stones, abdominal groans. Because of abdominal pain is due to various reasons. Maybe islet cell tumor or maybe because of the pancreatic calculus. I mean stones. Okay. Abdominal groans. Psychic moans. So this is a very classical description. You read it up yourself. But what I'm interested for you is to remember the last important thing. Parathyroid is some hyperparathyroidism is diagnosed by doing three important tests. If you remember that well and good. In exam, you tell hyperparathyroidism patient will have increased serum calcium level. Second, normally for you and me, if the calcium level is more, the parathormone level will be very low. That is normal. But if the patient has a parathyroid tumor, there is an inappropriate raise of PTH. So PTH, parathormone will be raised in this people. Okay. Third important thing is if you do a scan, the special scan we do nowadays is the system may be scan. Okay. Ultrasound is not enough. Those days we used to do a subtraction scan that is called a thallium technetium subtraction scan that is also now no longer done. CT, MRI, we do occasionally. 
it is only to look out for ectopic unusual position of thyroid parathyroid but commonest test now we do is system ab scan if you remember that see here is a system ab scan showing a hot nodule in the right left inferior parathyroid nodule okay here is a thyroid one is reflected behind the thyroid you can see a parathyroid adenoma these are the surgeries you will see once in a lifetime okay because we all of us should know there are normally you and me all have four parathyroid gland our aim is only to remove that particular gland which is causing the hypercalcemia by thanks to the system ab scan now we are able to identify out of the my four gland only this gland is only enlarged i can put a laparoscopy and remove only that particular gland so that is called minimally invasive surgery so that is possible nowadays okay now i think i have finished all i wanted to discuss i took more time than i anticipated but never mind now it is a time for all of you have a chat now rajaram hello yes sir uh, can you unmute everybody and how was the audio so far is reasonable sir yes sir it is not distracted sir okay okay and if there anything in the chat box let me see in the meantime i'll i'll kindly feed your bit pemberton test we discussed okay discord and nodule this is inappropriate that is a hot nodule cold nodule all those things you read it up okay anything else students want to ask then otherwise we will go again for the five or six questions now mcq anybody wants to stay for mcq i don't know most of you are at home the dinner will be waiting but people or in the hostel may they have to rush to the saturday night to the hostel but i'll try to quickly finish the questions if there is no questions we'll go gautam reshma anybody wants to ask hello sir nishan yes yeah, sir why thyroid disease is more common in female sir yes that you have to find out and tell me usually there is some because it is a hormone response for some reason or other it is actually incident it is an observation i mean it is made the female women or more that is how common it is three times to four times more common in women than compared to the men that is no second we know the statement is if men if they are present with a goiter especially a solitary nodule take it from me it is almost always a malignant goiter because men they have no right it is like that okay this is the reason i don't see any specific reason most of the other things are like hypothetical they'll give all those uh, olden theories but there is no actual it is only a coincidence by by collecting the statistics we gather the information it is an observation okay there is no real basic reason i could find out okay and also there is no paradoxical menstrual change reason that also i don't think there is any specific thing it is all observations see there are some clinical findings and there may not be any explanation biochemically and also by all these things something beyond our understanding sometimes you can always give some hypothesis but that has to be proved whatever i am telling is a proven findings or proven investigations only there are some unproven and uh, there are some reasons some examiner will accept some may not accept i don't want to dwell into the controversial areas i want to give you the minimum essential information the controversies are all only is for post graduates and specialists because they know more and more about less and less you should know less of i mean the commonest thing okay you have to give precisely what you need to know to clearly go for exam pass without any controversy so don't go to get into controversy don't outsmart the examiner that's what i'm trying to tell you examiner will is asking you a question and you just give the answer and go away don't try to impress him too much then you will be always in the losing side because the examiner is much smarter than you so that's a small little extra tip i want to give you all so you common questions common things only you need to understand all these things i know it is all uh, people curious but there is no real reason why there is a menstrual disturbances uh, in opposite to what you really anticipate if anybody knows that i am very very welcome to listen if in this audience if you hear from somebody it is always a, a life long learning experience even for me anybody know the i think sarmila asked the question do you know sarmila yourself 
uh, you read anywhere or you really want to know i don't know the reason and uh, we can ask the gynecologist next next time if you go and meet somebody they might come with uh, some sensible answer anyway any other question any one of you no yes then i'll just to start sharing again let me just see quickly while papillary carcinoma following are the features of papillary carcinoma one is a wrong one okay so obviously i am sure all of you know okay it is a commonest tumor very good prognosis anybody wants to give an answer which is a wrong answer in this one so blood spread sir good because it is a lymphatic spread isn't it but what is orphan any nuclei do you know is it joseph oh, asking right. question oh, who is asking the answering let so me yes, okay go on so this is orphan any nuclei is very classical because the nuclear material the chromatin in the nucleus is pushed to the periphery so it is a looks like a empty nucleus the nuclei looking very empty with the chromatin pushed to the periphery like this so that's why all the clear cells like i without this okay sclera cornea like that it is empty eyes this is actually you need not so you can imagine the whether the child is crying or smiling it is up to you you can imagine either way so orphan any okay without any emotion so they just to draw this is a very important american cartoon film so it's like an empty eye of an orphan any there is an empty nuclei in papillary carcinoma so this is a very important mcq question they sometimes ask you clear vacuolated nuclei okay next retrostrenal goiter i have given you some facts one of them is a wrong one which is the wrong statement anybody this i didn't well because you should realize the thyroid retrostrenal goiter wherever it is extending it is usually extending from the lower border of the thyroid it always receives its blood supply from the vessels that is the inferior and the superior thyroid vessels in the neck they don't receive blood supply from anything from the retrostrenal region so you need not do a sternotomy okay you can just make a simple same incision you can just put your finger or a spoon and you can just inoculate okay like a delivering a baby you will be able to remove but of course if it is a too large and if you do a ct and if it is closely related to the great vessels sometimes you need to have the cardiothoracic surgeon and rarely we do a sternotomy if you have a 100 case of retrostrenal goiter usually about 5 or 6 cases only go for a sternotomy it is not that common so sternotomy is seldom done because the blood supply is from the neck not from the heart or from the thorax so that is the answer okay next this one is i have given you four different neck swelling 1 2 3 and 4 i have given you about 9 or 10 differential diagnosis number 1 is what from this list 2 3 4 who wants to take a challenge like a spotter start from the ec1 anybody let us see the answer then thyroglossal cyst in a 11 year old boy branchial cyst junction of the upper one third lower two third in front of the anterior border of the sternomastoid midline swelling dermoid this elderly man with a large swelling here and also a little bit of skin ulceration or skin involvement usually of this size in this position the age group in a smoker is secondary lymph node unless proved otherwise okay and what is the name of this investigation 
a case of hypercalcemia this is like a quick spotter this cesta may be scan you can see a delayed scan showing a left sided parathyroid adenoma okay diagnosis here a patient who is having a voracious appetite losing weight staring look diffuse goiter so this is a thyroid toxicosis but the question i want to ask you is i have given you all the signs of exophthalmos but one is not a sign of exophthalmos can somebody tell which is not a sign of exophthalmos hill sign sir what is hill sign very nice hill sign everyone go and read hill sign is a vascular sign it is a sign sometimes seen in a case of aortic incompetence the systolic blood pressure a popliteal artery and brachial artery if the difference if it is more than 60 mm then it is usually it is a hyperdynamic circulation it sometimes it is a hill sign positive we say see there are lots of there are hundred i mean 10 or 12 signs you may have to remember for aortic incompetence isn't it or aortic regurgitation it is hill sign is one of the sign you see in your leg okay so that is the next important thing all the different geoffroy sign i have given you stelvock sign dal rimple sign what it is and von grafy sign and other sign i missed here is a mobius sign anybody knows what is mobius sign failure of convergence of the eye you are not able to look at your nose of patient to look at the tip of the patient's nose they are not able to converge eh, because of the the palsy okay this is a very important mobius sign okay this is i think probably the last mcq this patient is presenting with a, a classical finding okay this is called a knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle in other words there is no knuckle this knuckle is missing okay knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle syndrome otherwise called in other way they have a short fourth metacarpal or metatarsal okay like this very unusual but if they present like that immediately you need to clinch a diagnosis anybody bright answer from any one of you alphabet a is all bright syndrome it is actually a rare cause of pseudo hypoparathyroidism okay short stature people if they present like this this is one of the important thing okay all bright syndrome and this is the last i think total thyroid active specimen i think already you have seen it if you see eosinophilic material the diagnosis is medullary carcinoma thyroid yes i think that's all we have here for you and thank you very much i apologize if there is any difficulty in the transmission we have but i think from next week we are going to have a stable net connectivity not a mobile connectivity like last week this week because I had to travel to various places that's why changed the more important topic for you next week is of course every other candidate in undergraduates get a inguinal swelling there is a groin hernia so we need to have a very clear understanding of the common questions of hernia both clinical examination very rarely they ask you in essay it's only the clinical when you have a case of hernia femoral inguinal hernia how to examine come out in a passing note that is a challenge that will face it all of us together and uh, until now thank you very much have a relaxing weekend and a dinner thank you we'll stop sharing now <laughs>